Now that yields are higher, people are getting to grips with the idea of owning single bonds. And yet understanding bond funds is much more difficult conceptually. So in this video, we tackle some of those most difficult questions around bond funds. What drives their price, their income, and what generates their risk and return? And how can we gauge those risks and returns when looking at a bond fund. This video is sponsored by Lightyear, a UK investment platform that offers you the ability to trade stocks, funds, but also to earn interest on your uninvested cash. So let's look at how to understand bond funds in a bit more detail. So let's start with those difficult questions which people are struggling to answer. I think the first one is common to many people who've got bonds as part of their pension, say, and they're nursing losses of 30-40% after the big sell-offs of the last couple of years. So the question is always, why has the price fallen so much? I thought this was safe. And a kind of related question is, why didn't it hedge my stock portfolio? Another thing which baffles people is they see interest rates have risen, but when they look at the income on one of these funds, it hasn't, and they wonder why. Another question I get asked a lot is, look, here's the yield to maturity of my bond fund. What does it mean? So we'll also dig into that question. But let's begin by looking at the differences between single bonds and bond funds. Now, the beauty of a single government bond is that almost everything is known about it. For example, we know the income because that's the coupon on the bond. If you know how much face value you own, you know how much income you'll receive and when you'll receive it. You know the amounts to the penny and you know the dates they'll be paid to the day. You also know the future price, at least on the maturity day, will be £100 or $100. And because you know those two things, you also know the yield to maturity. And that's on the day that you buy the bond. You never need to take a loss on one of these because you know the return you're going to get. Whereas with a bond fund, we swap all of those certainties for uncertainties. We don't know what income we're going to receive exactly. It varies slowly over time. We don't know the future price of the fund. That also varies over time. And then finally, we don't know the yield or return on the fund because that too is uncertain. So what does a single bond look like if we buy one? So here's a really simple example with a bond which we're going to buy from someone else and we're going to buy it at a price of £96. Now the bond has one year until maturity, which is going to hold it until it matures so we don't have to sell it. The coupon on the bond is 1%. So we paid £96 for it and we're going to receive £100 at maturity. That's its face value. So we paid £96 for £100. That means we're going to get a £4 return or 4%. And then on top of that, we'll get the income of 1%. And because it's a government bond, we know precisely when those cash flows will occur and also precisely how big those cash flows will be. So the yield on this government bond is a combination of two things. It's the capital gain plus the income. The capital gains 4%, the income's 1%, so in total the yield to maturity will be about 5%. So given all these certainties, why would we ever throw those away and opt for the uncertainty around a bond fund? I think for a lot of people it's about simplicity. It feels simpler to buy a bond fund. Plus some platforms don't let you buy single bonds. For example, I'm on the Vanguard UK platform and I can't buy single bonds on that platform. I had to open up a new account on Interactive Investor just to trade single bonds. Another reason people buy them is they want some kind of diversification away from their domestic yield curve. If you're worried that your government is not particularly responsible with its spending, perhaps you want exposure to other countries which are more responsible, or perhaps their yield curves are more attractive. Either way, by buying a global bond fund, you're going to get exposure to those other yield curves. There's also the ability, if you are going to buy foreign bonds, to hedge that exposure so you're not taking a currency risk. But as a retail investor, you probably wouldn't be able to do that if you're going to be buying government bonds. You can't buy currency hedge overlays as you would if you're an institutional investor like a hedge fund. And if you're going to buy corporate bonds, which we'll talk about at the end of this video, then this is a good example where diversification makes sense. Because if one issuer of bonds goes bust, you're not going to be that worried about it. It'll mitigate your losses. So let's start with the safest type of bond fund, and this is a money market fund. So let's introduce the yield curve at this point. On the x-axis, you can see the maturity of UK government bonds. On the y-axis, you can see the yield on those bonds, roughly the return you'll get. Now, as I make this video in November of 2023, the yield curve is 
pretty weird because it's inverted. The short end of the curve is giving a higher income than the long end of the curve, despite the short end being safer. In other words, you're being compensated more to take less risk. Now, if you want to harvest that short end of the yield curve, money market fund buy ultra short duration instruments at the short end of the curve. So these might be government bonds with just six months to run or three months to run. But at the moment, that's generating a pretty good income. They also invest in other short term financial instruments like commercial paper, repo transactions or certificates of deposit, but all give roughly the same rate of interest, which currently is over 5%. If you drill into the contents of one of these money market funds, so here's one from iShares called Earns, very good name. Notice that almost two thirds of the bonds which are held by this fund have a really short maturity of between zero and one year. And if we drill into the credit quality, we'd also see that that's very, very high grade. So really with these funds, you're earning a cash-like rate of interest, but the beauty of it is compared to something like a deposit at a bank is that you're not locked into that agreement for some period of time, like a year or two years. You can sell one of these money market funds at any time you like, and you can hold them inside an ISA or a SIP so that if you want to sell them to buy some other form of investment, it's very easy to do that within the account. Now, I spoke about money market funds and for short term yield, these are a great option to invest your cash. Now, let me quickly mention that this section involves financial promotions and Lightyear, who sponsored today's video, offers its users to invest cash and earn 5.44% gross yield. And they do that by investing in the BlackRock Sterling money market fund. As you remember, these money market funds invest in short term cash like securities, and these come with a lower risk than investing in equities. Of course, these funds don't have the FSES protection that you'd get from investing in savings accounts, but they usually offer higher interest and on light year can be easily cashed out with next day payout, unlike fixed term bank deposits. On light year, all interest gained from money market funds are paid out each month as dividends. And as a light year user, you can decide whether you want to reinvest them, let it sit in your sterling account and earn 4.5% net interest, or invest in ETFs, for example, which are free of execution fees. You can invest your cash starting from just one pound. And although the rate may fluctuate daily, light years BlackRock money market funds are less sensitive to short term interest rate changes because of their AAA asset composition. Use the code PENSIONCRAFT, the name of our channel, and earn $10 worth of a US fractional share. Both Lightyear and I want to emphasize that when investing, your capital is at risk and the value of your investments may go up as well as down. Now, although it sounds obvious, the most important thing about a bond fund is what's in it. So whenever I'm presented with a bond fund, the first thing I'll try to do is to figure out what's in it. What are the types of bonds and what are the risks and returns which are associated with them? So what we're going to do is to drill into a really simple bond fund and one which doesn't contain many bonds so that we can actually take it apart into its component pieces to see how it works. And the bond fund we're going to use is this iShares Gilt Fund. So this buys UK government bonds, which are called gilts. They used to have a gilt edge around them because they're very high credit quality. And from its name, you can tell that this buys a restricted set of maturities ranging between zero years and five years. So my mental checklist would be something like this. I'd say, OK, what does it contain? It contains UK government bonds. These have a very low credit risk, so they're very safe. And consequently, they'd have a relatively low return. So I'm not expecting to shoot out the lights with the returns. I'm just opting for safety. And there's double safety here, because if we look at the maturity of the bonds inside the fund, they're short maturity bonds, which tend to have a low volatility, as we'll see. So low duration means low volatility, small price fluctuations. So when we're thinking about the contents of these funds, it's something like a conveyor belt, because remember, bonds come with a maturity date. In this fund, we've got bonds of up to five years in maturity. So if I wait for a year, then the one year bond is going to mature and roll off the end of the conveyor belt. If I wait two years, then the one year and the two year bonds will have rolled off. 
And if I wait five years, well, all of the bonds will have matured. Now, what the manager of the fund, BlackRock, can't do is turn around to their clients and say, I'm sorry, all the bonds have matured. It's now a cash fund. Is that okay? Of course, it's not okay. And what BlackRock has to do is as each bond matures, it goes out and buys another five-year bond in this case. So it has to keep the conveyor belt going as a bond matures, it reinvests the money at the five-year part of the curve. So in this sense, the content of the fund change all the time. It's why the return of the fund is unpredictable because it's driven by an ever-changing set of constituents. Now I chose this fund because it doesn't have many bonds in it. It just has 17 of them and you can see them listed next to me here. You can identify bonds by their maturity date and their coupon. So the first one to mature is going to be this 2024 bond with a coupon of 0.13%. The next one to mature will be the 2024 bond with a coupon of 1% and so on down the list until we get to the one with the longest maturity and that's just under five years. And that's a bond that matures in 2028 in October. So iShares is doing what it says on the tin. It's only buying bonds which have a maturity data between zero and five years. Now, if you're wondering how we determine the price of the fund, well, it's simply the sum of the individual bonds inside it. The total value of the fund is about 3.1 billion. And this is as of November the 13th, 2023. It'll change day to day. But you can see that roughly equal amounts are invested in each of those bonds. There is a bit of variation, but it's not huge. Now we can ask what happens if yields rise or fall. So here's the UK yield curve as of today. And you can also see where it was a month ago. So the green line is today's yield curve. The orange line is as it was a week or a month ago. And what you can see is that the whole yield curve has moved down between the zero and five year points, roughly as a parallel shift downwards for all of the bonds. Now, remember that with bonds, if the yield goes down, the price goes up. So because of that 0.37% fall in the yield, we know the price of the bonds in our fund will have gone up. But the question is how much? Well, the key number you need to know to work out how much the prices have risen is called duration. It's measured in years and it's simply a multiplier. So if the yield goes down by a certain percentage, you multiply that by the duration and that's the percentage amount that the bond will have increased in price. So the final two columns you can see here are the change in value of each of the bonds in the fund, both in monetary amounts, pounds, but also as a percentage. And notice how they gradually increase as you increase the duration of the bond. That's because longer duration bonds are more sensitive to yield curve shifts. So the bonds with almost five years till maturity have gained the most. If the yield curve had gone the other way, if yields had increased, those same bonds would have lost more. So that's why the volatility of a bond depends on the duration. As the yield curve moves around, we're multiplying by the duration to work out how much the bond price moves around. And a big duration means big fluctuations and high volatility. Now, it's kind of inconvenient to use individual bond price changes to work out the price change of the fund. Fortunately, there's a shorthand you can use. If we take the weighted average of those durations for the individual bonds, and the weighting you use is the present value or the market value of each of the bonds, then that weighted average for this fund will come out at around 2.2 years. And in fact, that's what effective duration is. So if we'd have multiplied that fall in yield, 0.37%, by 2.22, we'd have got the percentage change in the value of the fund, which in total was 0.82%. So when you're buying one of these bond funds, the single most important number to look for when it comes to interest rate risk and volatility is that effective duration. Because a higher duration means more volatility, which means more risk of a crash. So that's our interest rate risk measure. So let's take a look at two extremes of duration from the United States. And these are two funds. One is called SHY, that's a very short maturity bond. And the other one's called TLT, which is very long duration US treasuries. The effective duration of SHY is very small, it's just under two years. And that means its volatility, its typical annual percentage price move, is also low. It's only around 2%. Whereas with TLT, the duration is over 16 years, it's much higher, and the volatility is also almost equity-like. That's at around 15%. That's the kind of volatility you'd expect from the S&P. So low volatility, you'll sleep well at night. Usually you won't get much return, although at the moment, because of the yield curve inversion, you will. And high volatility is going to be a roller coaster. The price will be very volatile. And if yields rise, you're going to see big crashes. Here you can see that in action. 
During the period from 2004 to 2020, yields were generally falling and TLT's price was rising very rapidly. You can also see that it was very volatile, it wasn't a smooth ride. Whereas SHY had very little fluctuation in price, but also not much return. So if you are going to be buying bond funds, pay attention to the duration. It's very important. If you think interest rates are going to fall, you'll go for long duration, that will maximise your returns. If you think interest rates are going to rise, then you'll go for very short duration. So now let's return to some of those questions which we can now answer. The first one is, why did my bonds lose so much money? Well, the answer is that you had a lot of duration in the bonds that you'd chosen. You can see that if you had a money market fund or a very short duration government bond fund, you wouldn't have lost much money at all. And of course, if you'd gone for single government bonds, well, then you wouldn't have had any losses. You'd have known exactly what the yield was when you bought the bond. The other question is, why didn't it hedge against a stock market fall? And here it's kind of interesting that if inflation is very high, there's an increased correlation between bonds and stocks. That's because high inflation is toxic for both of those asset classes. So the ability of bonds to hedge stocks depends on inflation being at a reasonable value. And when inflation spiked way up after the pandemic, then that hedge broke. Another question is, what's the income and how does it change? So let's go back to our really simple bond fund with 17 bonds in it. The annual income on a bond is just the product of two things. It's the coupon on the bond times the face value of the bond. If we multiply those two columns together, we can come up with an annual income for each of the bonds in our fund. Now the total is about 61 million pounds as of November 2023. Why does the date matter? Well, if we ask this same question in a year's time, a lot of these bonds will have matured. New bonds will have also been put into the portfolio to replace them and the coupons on those will be different. Now that 61 million is considerably less than the current yield on the five year part of the curve, which is over 4% in the UK. So why isn't the income on the bond fund immediately picking up that higher yield? And if we look at the portfolio characteristics on the iShares website, sure enough, you can see that the trailing 12 month yield, that's the income over the last 12 months, divided by the price of the fund today, is very low. It's only 1.7%, way below that 4% that we saw for yield to maturity. Well, let's go back to our analogy of a conveyor belt. If we think about our five year fund, on average, about half of the bonds are going to mature over the next two and a half years. So if new bonds are being issued by the government, which are going to pick up that higher income, it's going to take a while for those to be bought by the fund. Maybe it'll take one year, maybe two years for that income to start to pick up. And if we have a portfolio with even longer maturities in it, say a 15 year fund, well then on average, the contents will be replaced every seven and a half years. So it'll take even longer for it to pick up those higher incomes. So to answer the question as to why the income hasn't picked up, it's because the turnover of the portfolio hasn't picked up bonds with higher coupons yet. Money market funds, for example, because they buy ultra short duration instruments, pick up those coupon increases very quickly. Now that can be a benefit or a hindrance. If yields are falling, you don't want to pick up the lower incomes quickly. So then it's doubly beneficial to have long duration bond funds because the capital gain will be higher due to the long duration and the multiplier effect, but also the income, the highish income from the past will be locked in for longer. Whereas if rates are increasing, you want to go for short duration to pick up the income more quickly, but also to lose less value as yields rise. But what if you want a little bit more income than government bonds offer? Well, in this case, you might choose to buy corporate bonds. Now the yield on corporate bonds can be decomposed into different components. There's a risk-free component, which is common to all fixed income. That's what you'd receive by buying a government bond. But then you also receive an additional income for taking the credit risk of companies because companies can't print more money to pay you back and companies go bankrupt, in which case you could lose quite a bit of capital. So to compensate you for that, you're paid an additional spread, an additional income. And the size of that additional income is proportional to the additional risk you take. The risk and reward in fixed income is very clear. Some of that additional spread will come from credit risk, the risk of a default or bankruptcy, and some of it will come from illiquidity. And that's the risk that you can't sell the bond in a crisis. What you can also see is if you have investment grade bonds, these are high credit quality companies which are unlikely to default, 
the spread is usually smaller or tighter. Whereas if you go for speculative companies where they're much more likely to default, they'll also pay you a higher income. The spread is quite wide. The cutoff between the two, investment grade and speculative, is a credit rating that moves from triple B down to double B. When you cross that threshold, you get into junk territory. So always you should be thinking, is this extra compensation, this credit spread sufficient for taking the credit risks right now? And if we look at the current credit spreads, you can see that they're not very wide. We're not being compensated much for taking credit risk at all. Now, if we weren't expecting defaults to increase in the near future, that might be fine. However, some people do think that we're entering into a credit cycle where defaults are going to pick up. But credit spreads are not compensating us for that. So certainly at the moment, I don't think this is an attractive risk and reward in corporate bonds, particularly for high yield credit. But that's the judgment call on your part. Are you being sufficiently compensated for having those sleepless nights? You can also take credit risk with government bonds if you move into the emerging market space. So the issues here are not going to be developed market countries which have a very low credit risk. These will be emerging market countries which have a higher risk of default. So again, we can dig into the issuers if we look at one of these funds, in this case, SEMB, which is again from iShares. And you can see that the issuers have slightly lower quality credit. So these are countries like Mexico, many oil producing nations like Saudi Arabia, but also Turkey, Indonesia, China and Brazil. And looking at the dividend yield on the US version of that bond fund, which is called EMB, shows that it's around just over 5%. Compare that with a 10-year US Treasury fund, IEF, and that'll give you around 2.9%. So certainly there is a spread baked into this riskier fund, but the question is always, is it sufficient? And again, at the moment, I think I'd probably keep away from taking that risk. So hopefully that's given you the mental tools to understand bond funds better. I think it's a really important part of an investor's toolkit nowadays, now that yields are higher you're certainly getting a much better risk reward than you used to. And it's certainly worth considering adding them to your investment portfolio. Now, don't forget our offer from Lightyear. You can receive $10 worth of a US fractional share by using the code PENSIONCRAFT, the name of our channel, or use the link in the description below. And as always, thank you for listening.